Welcome to the Whiskey Vault. Funny story on the way up here, Fancy Dan tried to redeem himself with a foot race. Horribly embarrassed himself. Uh, What's up, uh, Dan? Hey. What's up? <laughs> I ran three steps. Smoked him. Three steps. Smoked him. Give me three steps, give me three steps, <laughs> mister. Give me three steps towards the door. That song's about, I don't know what to do. Yeah. Okay. We're back. It's been, uh, we had like a batch of videos for the Christmas holiday break. We've been on a hiatus. <laughs> How high was it? Hiatus, hiatus. Uh, so, yeah, it's been a minute since we've done some reviews. I'm looking forward to it. We're going to start it off with uh, Glenlivet 14. Okay. Okay. Now, I, this is not the first one. This is like the first end of the first week of January that this airs. Yeah. But we haven't shot we, in a while. We pre shot a whole bunch right. of stuff. This is a gift from Jan Hutchins. Jan Hutchins, you magnificent bastard. Yeah, see, I did a leg lift on that. You oh. see that? Oh. It's like a baseball. Kicking off. The yeah. Game. You got to do that. For momentum. You follow yeah. through. I, you know, I can. It's, it's the American pastime. You got, I can start adding a little baseball You, got, you ever see the, uh, like the cards where they're in mid-throw? Yeah, and, and it just looks like, like their arm's going to break yeah. and snap in half on the yeah. elbow. All right, this is a 14-year Glenlivet. I finished in cognac. Oh, interesting. Good. Because I remember yeah, well, Glenlivet well, well. being, well, while we're at it. We're going to try it. Well, I already poured you that amount. I just didn't pour me that amount. I, we're going to try the classic Glenlivet, too. Okay, because I remember Glenlivet, the classic one being you know it's nice there's nothing wrong with it but it's pretty tame pretty safe uh pretty well, we're gonna sweet. pair it to is the budget one not a lot of complexity to it but the fact that this had an interesting finish mm -hmm. cognac now in theory it's already in bourbon and sherry casks yeah, yeah and then they take some of those and they finish them for six months in cognac okay now cognac is, is brandy mm -hmm. effectively right okay. but specifically has to be from certain regions in france the cognac region has to be double pot distilled has to be at least two years old in oak wow. for joke, and uh has to be from a specific uh white wine grapes i was holding this like pretty far away i wasn't getting into the notes but it still floated up it's yeah very, it's very very wine -y, present yeah right Oh, fruity too. It's like a, it's like the kind of fruitiness that you get from really fruity wine. Right. Yeah, a red. Now I'm gonna tell you something interesting about cognac here in a little bit mm -hmm. because I think I hope it becomes the future of American whiskey, or at least a, a strain. I think it, I hope it shows up in American whiskey. All right, well, Not everything, but I hope it becomes more common. The back pocket. We'll see how this is doing with the cognac there. And on the nose, I'm getting the um, hmm, what is that? So it's the the sweeter scotches. I'm trying to say if that's a heather. Or I I think that's what the Glen Livet's bringing to the table. I think yeah. the malt barley is bringing this sort of grainy earthiness. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the, what the cognac's bringing, I am going to feel more comfortable comparing that to the classic. Yeah, but to Than me, I will just going in blind. Or, I guess, in a vacuum without an AB. Right. Yeah. And uh, to me, you, when you get the, uh, like the sherry cask, you get often in the Olorosa these almondy fruit notes, right? And they're and, usually... Darker, and then in Pedro, fruit notes. in Pedro, yeah. you get darker, heavier okay. plum and See, things like is that. Is Pedro used more often? Because when it comes to a sherry cask finish, I'm usually finding the darker fruit notes than I am yeah, the almond notes. You're lacking the A-B comparison of Pedro versus Oloroso. Okay. So if you just go blind and say any sherry cask, you're going to find darker fruits, hmm. right? But in the darker fruit category, right. Pedro is the even deeper, even darker, and Oloroso is uh, on the shallower end of dark fruits with an almondy note added in there as well. Interesting. Right? So uh, Pedro is so much sweeter. Okay. I'm going to taste this now. It smells really nice. I like, I like the nose a lot. I feel like whatever brandy is adding is really <laughs> subtle, but the cognac is adding. Yeah. Because think about it. Cognac is, is the closest thing wine has to whiskey. Yeah, it's and, grapes distilled and then barrel aged. And honestly, the notes that I was getting on this nose, you could have just told me sherry cask is involved. I was like, okay, mm -hmm. I, that seems familiar. But I want to do the AB here in a sec. Oh, it's in the palate. Ooh, it's dry. It's dry and almost woody. And then there's this slight candied, like Smarties candied note that goes through into some like hinting at fruits. I got to go in again. It's a 40% ABV, by the mm -hmm. way. So they took it to the floor. But nice. Uh, there's a nice amount of flavors, even at that very low proof. It's sweet without being cloying. Yeah. 
right? I would agree. So it definitely finishes sweet, but it's kind of dry, but it's not like, nah, this is just is sticking to my palate. So there's the simple, nice, competent maltiness that I expect from a Glenlivet. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it doesn't, it's not game changing. Mm -mm. Like, uh, what was that? It's a subtle impact. Yeah, what was that? Um, was it the Mezcal? Yeah, it was the Mezcal Duer. That was the one where you get in there, it's like, oh, they absolutely did something funky and interesting to this. This, if you didn't know it was a cognac finish, you would be hard pressed to point to point to cognac barrels. Wow, the nose is a really small, smaller difference than I thought it would be. Yeah, there is a difference, but there is a difference, and it's definitely sweeter and more like plum. Yeah, it's less of the uh, those um, darker ripe fruit notes mm -hmm. and the classic than there is. And the cognac finish. This is like honey by, fruits and honey bear. By this, you mean the classic. Yeah, the classic is, the Founders Reserve is honey and peach and light fruit, ending with a little bit of a barrel zest, and okay. the grain is sort of subdued a okay. little bit. Yeah. This was exactly what I was expecting from the standard Glenlivet. It is, like, there's nothing wrong with it, but it's so simple. Mm-hmm. It's so... Even like, the malty notes are a little bit subdued. Yeah, it's like the volume on all of this is dialed way back. And if you, you know, get hit too hard too quickly with a lot of flavors in whiskey, if you want something that's really tamed before the ice even goes in, right. man, that's about as tame and soft and simple as it gets. Uh, the AB comparison, well, the cognac finish actually did add quite a lot. I just wouldn't have attributed it to something outside of the standard whiskey finishing practices. Right. Can, cognac barrels, I feel. I think it feels very at home in the world of whiskey. I agree. I think it matches really well. I, I think, hope, we could say, say anywhere other than from the cognac region of France, this will be a brandy finished okay. scotch, yeah. right? And we've got plenty of brandy in the US. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I wouldn't be looking forward to some more brandy finished whiskeys because it's so close in right. family to, to whiskey. Right. I, so I like this with the cognac finish. Mm -hmm. Not just a little better. I like it a lot better. Me too. I like it a lot better. I think it was a definite improvement to the Glenlivet. Still and, simple. And it, but a definite improvement. But comparatively, yeah, and it more makes rich. It, yeah, it makes it way more rich. Yeah. Um, more layers. I wonder how much of that is just outright 14 years old versus no age statement. Yeah, I'm sure that's part of it, but even beyond, because with an age statement, oftentimes you can get in something that's a younger version. You can right. see, oh, there's the direction that we can see that's going to end up as it matures more. This, though, there are added elements that have no representation in this younger one at all. Right. Yeah. All right now, let me tell you real quick. Cognac. Yeah. So this is a way oversimplification, but when someone distills cognac mm -hmm. or distills the grapes and turns it into cognac, twice distilled, possible, yeah. right? Um, when it's in their own barrel on their own vineyard, it's still considered, it's not considered cognac yet. Mm. No matter how old it gets. It's called eau de vie, and it's, it's basically a distilled grapes okay. in a barrel, right? Okay. It could be brand new, it could be, you know, 20 years old. It's still not considered cognac until it gets blended with other eau de vies. That's like the opposite of single malt. Right. Wow. And it's not considered cognac. The blend is considered the art of cognac. The oh. art of cognac is yeah. we pulled from like all these different vineyards right. and we tasted, you know, 20 a day or a thousand a year. Yeah. And we created the next round of Hennessy or the next round of, right? Yeah. Right? I, and this is why some of the biggest blenders coming into American whiskey right yeah. now have brandy in their background. Yeah. Because these, this is a whole industry that prizes blending as an art form, as the art form. Right. I would love to see that showing up in America more, well, where that, blending is considered an art form. And I think within the past few years, that has happened. Oh, no, we're getting there. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, up until fairly recently, to your point, mm -hmm. uh, blends, it was kind of like, ah, if I can't get right. my hands on a nice single whatever, and a, um, single barrel, single malt, what have you. Um, then yeah, maybe I'll do a blend and put some ice and some soda in it. But yeah. now it's like, no, the, the, the world of blends, it executed well, with finesse. Because this is what originally people thought of as blends, right? right? And so much so in America, in America. Not, we're not talking about scotch, in right. American whiskey. Yeah. So much so that even when High West started blending things, mm -hmm. 
right? Even just their own rye with high MGP rye, it was considered like, well, you know, they're mixing some things together. It was like this like weird, like but, subpar. But, I, I, but no. You and I have had uh, kind of the first-hand experience of we just screwing around, doing some episodes, and then sometimes the camera things. will be on, sometimes the camera will be off. We got some sample pours left over, we'll put them together. And like a, a surprising number of times, wow. That was really good. Yeah, that was really good. Yeah. yeah, and sometimes things that, you know, we were just like, that's okay. You put them together, you add that complexity, mm -hmm. um, and it becomes a new thing. It's yeah. very, very different than what the original ingredients were. We're always encouraging people to do it with our own whiskey collections. Yeah, I mean, a way to yeah. do it is with an infinity bottle, but if you're going to even be even more exact and intentional. So I'm going to go on record, first yeah. week of January, is that's my hope for 2021. Okay. That we start to see the progression of blending as an art form in America versus blending as something that a few people are doing. The continued progression. Mm -hmm. Andrea Capitani, fun story. A really good friend of mine decided to get me a present for Christmas and she said, word for word, I know you like whiskey, so I bought you one of my favorites. Open the box and it's a Southern comfort. <laughs> I should be an actor for how good my reaction was. <laughs> By the way, I can't stand it. I'm yeah, fine. so I have absolutely had it. We've all been there, yeah. Yeah, like, oh, you like whiskey? I got you this gift. Yeah. You're like, Thanks. Thanks you yeah. so much. That's great. <laughs> Actually, would I get more than that? Because people know enough about me that they don't buy me whiskey. Yeah. Right? E even if that wasn't because I have access to whiskey, it's because it's like, well, you're serious about it, and I don't want to risk buying you something you don't like, right? Yeah. But what does happen is some random relative will be like, hey, my uncle died, or hey, my friend died, and I uh, found these, you know, old bottles in there, and I knew you're a whiskey guy. Right. So I brought, and all it is is like a 30-year-old bottle of, you know, Jim Beam, right. half full. But it's, it's like, uh, I mean, it thanks, could be. I guess. No, yeah. but it's, it's, it's like old, old, like seriously, obviously yeah. it doesn't really change that much. No, no. Um, I mean, it's not a dr something you want to drink. It's something that's like, hey, this is a 30-year-old yeah, vintage bottle. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Casey Pearson, in relation to flavor drift experiments, mm -hmm. have you ever really loved a whiskey and then come back to it and disliked it because of the change of flavors, mm -hmm. like what drifted was uh, what made it unique or special. Yes, 100% was Longmore and 16 for me. I've told the story a couple of times. Yeah. But uh, when they rebranded Longmore and 16, they, according to what I've read, they started using older barrels. Mm -hmm. And it lost that sparkle that the youth was bringing to the blend and that zesty pepper note. Yeah. Um, I have seen it. I feel like I've seen it in some like monkey shoulder level blends. Yeah where I've come back to it after a long, uh, here's one, Kylo. Kylo? Yeah. Um, and I don't know if we have it in here. All right, no. so while you look for that, I would say just one final note on the Glenlivet here. If on a scale of one to 10 of there being nuance and complexity, if the standard Glenlivet, for me in terms of complexity and just interesting things going on on a scale of one to 10, it'd be like a two or three. This takes it up to about a five or a six. Still, in the grand scheme of things, it's not wildly complicated and have like really game-changing, interesting stuff to go exploring with. But the difference between these is very meaningful. I appreciated what they did. I think it turned out well. Here's one I'm going to pour it because I want to see if I'm right. Yeah. That bank note, it's like a bottom shelf budget blend okay. in uh, like Total Wine. Mm -hmm. And I, when I first bought it, just because I was curious, yeah. I tasted it and I was like, son of a bitch, I would make this my decanter whiskey. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like it's actually... Pretty damn good. It's five-year-old blended scotch, right? Okay. And it looks like an American whiskey label. Yeah. And then Bank I note. finished. I finished a bottle, and I didn't get around to pouring another one or getting another one. Right. And then a year later, I'm like, oh, I need another bottle of banknote. Yeah. And I bought it. I took one sip. It went, oh, <laughs> oh. So either something totally changed, or like the month or two that I was drinking it from the decanter, right. I was under some sort of spell. Well, and also keep in mind that like the thing that is as likely to change as flavor drift is you and your own palate. Mm -hmm. um, the, the best way to tell is just that direct A-B comparison, bottle next to bottle, because if you're going by memory, people's changes, their tastes, their preferences, it evolve over time, absolutely. So this is 43, but I, it smells fine. This remember, super budget. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is Peter Golden budget. Honestly, man, if you put my nose in here, mm -hmm. I would say it's like I'm in North America right now. It's like a slightly smoked Canadian nose. Yeah, very vanilla. Water and ash. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't taste as... Originally, it was far more butterscotchy. Mm. It's like, uh, yeah, it's a watered-down vanilla and an ashy note. 
Yeah. It's not there's no offensive flavors. It's no, just no, very, this is very basic. This is so much better than the, the than the Peter Golden line. Freaking Peter Golden. <laughs> uh, All right. Did you did you did you see the fancy Dan's um the best silences of 2020? Oh, so good. The the responses were hilarious because they ranged from like, what the fuck is this bullshit? Yeah. All the way to like, people who said that in earnest. Yeah. Go away. Yeah. We don't want you here. All the way to the people who were like, this is. I, I really love this. I should hate this. We but this need is more amazing. of these. Yeah. <laughs> and my favorite was one guy who was like, this is the best review this channel's ever done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, a couple of comments. One of which we all knew about your uh, affinity for the black v necks. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. One of the things that that, like, put a giant spotlight on. Is that I never changed clothes? No, no, no. It's not always about you. Oh, okay. <laughs> my go to move, apparently. Every time I get into a glass, yes. The step back. What the hell is yeah. that? <laughs> yeah, nonstop. Take a drink. Take, take a step, step back. back. <laughs> yeah. I never realized. Yeah. I did that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, don't watch that whole thing. You will you get all self-conscious about all kinds of quirks. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was the only one. Yeah. That was the Not only for one. Me. <laughs> <laughs> Here's dividing, stealing, and drinking. You fight me and fight for a friend. You steal, may you steal your liver. And if you drink, Smart. you gotta wait though. There's a, there's a, you gotta. This, this. You, you just drug out that last word. You, you were off on the timing, well, and then you blamed it on me. <laughs> and if you drink, <laughs> may, may you drink, drink with us. I totally didn't forget the line. <laughs> da, 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 da. The bottle, though. Put it on the thing. Captain Ron. The bottle, Lord. <laughs>